So, the prologue is now up at IGN. I put up a reaction video yesterday. Now let's dig into what we learned from it. I'll go through the video in chronological order, showing off parts that seem interesting or are worth discussing. Literally the first thing we see is a full moon. If this isn't about werewolves, then they're just screwing with us at this point. Quickly, we move into the Evil Dead style monster POV zooming through the woods. This isn't an accident, of course. The Evil Dead gets name-checked later in the prologue. And, of course, the movie was written and directed by Sam Raimi, Ted's brother. The game starts on June 24th, just before midnight. As we predicted based on the wording of their bios, Max and Laura are heading up before the start of camp, while the rest of the game is going to be set at the end of camp, presumably one lunar month later. The Route 919 thing is likely a reference to the number of the beast. Since 919 inverted is 616, the actual number of the beast. Fun fact, the main Marvel Universe is called Universe 616 because Alan Moore wanted people to know that Marvel was hell and the people who ran it were devils. So he assigned it that number when writing Captain Britain. He assumed the editors at Marvel wouldn't understand the significance of the number and he was right. The song that's playing over the start is Thorn In My Side. I'm gonna put a link to it in the description below the video. It's notable that the lyrics talk about how nothing is what it seems, and Laura shuts off the radio as it's referencing the smallest cut. Which, of course, is all you need to turn into a werewolf if that cut came from a claw or fang. And if nothing is what it seems, does that mean we're not getting werewolves, but something much stranger instead? I would have liked O Death here, but of course that wouldn't have been appropriate, since it always plays after the prologue, not right at the start of the game. So even though it's now linked to the curator as his theme song, there's still a chance it'll show up in the quarry. If not over the start, then at least in the end credits. This is what the new QTEs look like. I kind of hate them? I've been against gesture-based QTEs ever since Manhunt 2. Hopefully we only ever have to push in directions like Dragon's Lair or Shenmue, rather than perform some complex motions like one of those garbage Quantic Dream games. But this isn't off to a promising start. Columbus never actually landed in North America. This statement about Columbus never getting to America is true. He landed in the Bahamas. North and South America are called that because of their relative positions compared to where his expedition first landed. Also, Columbus got a day named after him to try and bring respect to Italian Americans after they'd been the victims of repeated instances of anti-immigrant violence. Fun facts! The timed decision reminds me more of Hidden Agenda than Until Dawn of the Dark Pictures. I'm guessing that in the co-op voting mode, players will move their markers to the one they want, which is why the decisions are at the bottom of the screen. It would kind of break the game's mood to have colored lights flitting around the screen anytime we got to a decision point. Also, I'm super excited to see that leaflet once I play the game. Okay, Max is a terrible driver. You shouldn't take your eyes off the road on an empty four-lane highway, but a narrow forest road in the middle of the night? Do you want to die? This clearly seems to be a naked person crouched in the middle of the road, and not, as I'd hoped, a werewolf. Something about the legs seems off to me, like there are too many joints. It could be just an angle thing, though, and I'm historically bad at recognizing weird images in these teasers. So is this some kind of beast, or is it someone running from the beast? We saw Jacob locked up nearly naked in one of the videos, so maybe that's a thing the killbillies do before feeding them to a monster? On the way down the hill, we see Eliza in the back seat of the car, suggesting that she could very much be playing a curator-style role in the game. Also, note that she really does look like a corpse, which could go a long way towards explaining the disappearing body mentioned in the podcast and newspaper. This letter is just hilariously cruel. The text is a perfectly fine, let them down easy, thanks for replying kind of thing. But then there's a giant rejected stamp at the top. I know that they thought they needed to put that there because many, if not most players, won't actually read the text, but the result is hilarious. Other takeaways. Asheville, where they're from, is a real place, but the address doesn't exist. There's no Fullerton Street, but there is a lab called the Fullerton Genetic Center, which is a little weird. Also, why are a couple of teens from North Carolina going to work at a camp in upstate New York? I wonder if there's a story there. Also, it's possible that Asheville was chosen because Ash is the famously one-handed main character of the Evil Dead franchise. Landis University is named after John Landis, the writer-director of the seminal werewolf movie An American Werewolf in London. The other names listed, Max Brinley and Helena Mason, 
don't ring any bells, but that doesn't mean they're not important. Their license plate is ADFF674. Likewise, I don't know if this means anything, but license plates are always worth checking out. Also, apparently North Carolina has a three-letter four-number arrangement, and in fact, no place in America uses four letters and three numbers. If you want to find that, it seems you have to come to Ontario, where I live. The developers going out of their way to have an inaccurate plate suggests that the letter and number combination is probably meaningful in some way. I look forward to finding out how. The logo for Max is Annoyed is a raven, presumably the one that hangs out with Eliza in her room. Is this also the curator in disguise? I have no proof of that, but we'll assume it is so until it is definitively disproven. Funny graphical glitch here. No wonder Laura tripped and fell. She was hovering three inches off the ground. Also, they neglected to show her sliding down an incline, which makes the cut super jarring. Looks like this game's premonitions are going to come in the form of Eliza's tarot cards. And honestly, I'm super annoyed at this video for not opening up and looking at it. For shame. There are 22 interesting tarot cards to draw from. After that, it's just different numbers of cups and swords and things like that. So plenty of good options to choose from there. Let's just take a moment to be impressed by how good this forest looks. It might even be better than the Until Dawn forest, which was my all-time favorite video game forest so far. This is seemingly running on an Xbox Series X, and the whole game looks fantastic. Here's the Eliza poster. Harem Scarum is both a term that means wild and reckless, and is the title of an Elvis Presley movie where he goes to the Middle East. The Escapology trunk contains a straight jacket and handcuffs, part of an escape artist's toolkit which is both an appropriate thing to see in a carnival wreck and great foreshadowing for later in the prologue when Laura tries to help someone escape from the bunker and maybe her own escape later in the game? Then we have a sideshow trailer for Silas the Dog Boy. Was this the werewolf as a child and later he escaped, absolutely wrecking the trailer and the carnival? Perhaps even killing Eliza and transforming her into a ghost who now tries to warn people to protect them from him? Hopefully we'll find out in the main game. It's worth mentioning that the whole Eliza scare scene is just fantastically staged and edited. Great work, Supermassive. In the trailer, we see Laura running through the woods with a backpack on. So either they've changed the model, or that scene is going to happen later in the game. Then we get the Travis scene, which features some fantastic acting from Ted Raimi. The man is a pro and terrifying in this part. The path chosen is kind of intrusive, especially with the video distortion calling attention to it. All choice-based games do this to one degree or another, but this seems like a little over the top. I'm instantly curious about the different paths that could have happened here. They seem to choose a path based on not saying that they saw a human in the road. My guess is if they think they saw an animal, Travis assumes they're not a risk and tells them to go to motel. But if they say they saw a person, he tells them to go straight to camp so that he can deal with them and cover up the situation. Is that the person's blood on Travis's face? Is that person's body in the trunk of his car right now? The motel is called the Harbinger because that's the role that Travis is playing in the game. The character that warns the main characters away from danger so that they can ignore him bringing tragedy on themselves. This concept was famously explored in the film Cabin in the Woods. Travis's insistence that they weren't supposed to get there a day early suggests that the camp's operations are clearly scheduled around when a full moon is, reinforcing the werewolf vibes. And yes, I checked, the full moon was, in fact, the night of June 24th, 2021, when this part of the game is set. Also, not for nothing, Travis, if you don't want people to go up to the camp, just tell them that the place has been rented out for a private party that night, and they don't want anyone crashing it. At the camp, we get a look at the map, but don't see the pool that was in Jacob's video. Also, apparently the treehouse is an official part of the camp, which I'm surprised by. Now we finally get to the bunker, which is an amazing sequence. First, we get a glimpse of the thing in the basement, which is profoundly not a werewolf, as far as I can see. Naked skin, hunched over, emaciated. I think it's worth noting that this might be the exact same pose, or maybe even model, that was out in the road. Now, we don't see the thing's head, so is this a realistic horror version of the old-time dog-faced boy freak? Which would literally be a normal person's body with a dog head, like a minotaur, but for a wolf instead of a bull? That would certainly explain a lot like this wolf face that we've pointed out earlier you see when it's attacking Max. I'm not saying Laura is an idiot, but once you've found the Ian Collar, another point for the Killbillies keeping people hostage and feeding them to a monster, and seen a corpse stripped to the bone, maybe don't continue exploring? I wonder what's going to happen if she abandons Max. Will she escape into the woods? 
Will someone other than Travis grab her? Will she get killed instead of drugged? Does Max survive, and this affects their relationship later on? So, who exactly is Travis shooting here? Is it the Beast to scare it away from Max's body? Or is he shooting Max to keep him from turning into a monster after being bitten by the Beast? Also, doesn't it seem like he's not aiming down enough, given the slope of the stairs leading into the bunker? How great is it that the teaser was the last shot of the prologue only played in reverse? That is a genius move, super massive. Okay, so, final thought. There's so many full moons in the prologue that at this point, it really is shaking my conviction that this is going to be about literal werewolves. Do I think they're going to be humanoid beasts and transformations of some kind? Sure, but I don't know that we're gonna get like a hairy wolf monster the way we might be expecting. That said, Until Dawn was super open about there being a monster right at the start of the game. And the only twist was the identity of the monster that stalks you for most of the game. So. That's my breakdown of the prologue. Short version, I loved it and can't wait to get my hands on it so I can see the different ways it plays out. June can't get here soon enough. I've been the Hidden Object Guru. Thanks so much for watching and special thanks to Ferret for helping me out with some details. Also thanks to my patrons, Marissa, Desire, Eduardo, Joanne, and Brian for your support. You can always find me at my live streams weeknights at 9 Eastern and weekends at noon. We'll see you back here for more Supermassive Games content. But until then, au revoir.